I'm Martin. I'm Jean-Marc. And we're going to talk about, as we said, microservices and monoliths. And we begin by saying, looking at the, what's happened with microservices. So a while ago, microservices was barely a word that was known to anybody. And in just the last few years, it has accelerated upwards. I was lucky enough to hear about microservices relatively early on because I'm part of the group at Fullworks that works on the radar. Um, I say I'm part of the group on the radar. I don't actually contribute anything. I just listen and kind of stroke my beard in a wise old man kind of way. But people were nattering about this microservices stuff. And eventually I said, oh, we really need to get a better handle of what this is. People are obviously very interested by it. But what does it really mean? I mean, how can we come up with some kind of definition of it? And the tricky with the thing about definitions in technology is you can't have you know, these rigorously defined things, particularly with something like this, because it's a lot of different stuff. And so the way I like to approach definitions is to say, well, how can we come up with some list of common characteristics? There's a bunch of people out there who say they're doing microservices. Again, this is before that curve went up. Um, so it's not that many projects. You look at them, they're not all doing the same thing, but there's quite a lot of common characteristics that really what, what it works out as saying is that most of the people who say they're doing microservices are doing most of the things on the on, in that characteristics list. So how could I get a good set of characteristics together? Well, I sat down with my colleague James Lewis, who was one of these people who had been involved in microservices from the beginning, and we wrote this article. Um, it appeared on my uh, website um, in 2014, as you can see, and there we listed out the common characteristics, which are these. I am not going to go through all of this list, because that would take all, of tw all the 20 minutes, and uh, Jamak would be just sitting around saying, <laughs> Martin, shut up! But what I will do is mention a couple of important ones that I particularly want to highlight at this point. The first is that top definition, componentization via services. So what does that mean? That's a kind of a bit of a weird phrase. But it basically means a software component is something we can independently replace or upgrade. And so what we want is the ability to be able to take our microservices and be able to implement a, a deploy a new version without having to coordinate with everybody else. And we need that degree of looseness and coupling. Another point that I think is really quite important is that we have decentralization on many of the decisions that we make, but particularly on how we handle our data. So one of the general rules about microservices is if you've got a million small services all on top of a big, one big database sharing the same data, they may be small services, but they are not microservices because of the fact that they're sharing that data. So what you want to do is you want to have these independently deployable components each with their own data talking through each other through a service in, in, interface. And when you have that, you have services that you can better control and manage and understand. Um, the rule for size, by the way, is big enough to fit in James Lewis's head. Um, so it, there's no hard rule here. Now, a common question I get asked when it comes to microservices is, well, we've got this nice big monolith, and we're beginning to struggle with it. We're having problems. We think that going the microservice path would be appropriate. How do I take an existing monolithic application and break it down into a cluster of microservices? And I have a very good answer for that. I say, I haven't the foggiest, but I know someone who does. <laughs> All right. So just to tell you the truth, the journey to microservices is an epic one. And like any epic journey, it starts with a dream. People dream about accelerating the growth of their organizations or dream about being able to do experimentation fast and release services quickly. And often, it leads with somebody taking that leap. Try to build a couple of services around the edges, some facade services on top of a monolith that already exists, enough build pipeline to get the service out to production. But to be telling the truth, you cannot really realize that dream unless you face the monolith. The existing systems that are locking up the precious data and the functionality, and it's very hard to be able to you know, provide that functionality independently to your customers. So that's, that's, that's the hard part. That's the bloody part of this journey, but it's not the end. 
journey continues with being able to transform your organizations, transform your teams around these services and operate these services and scale and repeat and re rinse and repeat and repeat um, that over and over to unlock new capabilities. What I want to focus on, what we want to focus on today is this part, how to break down a monolith what services to decouple and with, with, with what uh, order. Um, there is an article that Mar Martin has kindly let me publish on his website, that's a link to it. Don't go there just yet. At the end of the talk, you can go check it out uh, with the details that I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna take you through. All right, there are seven guidelines that I'd like to share. Number one, uh, minimize dependency back to the monolith. If you're extracting the services um, do it in an order that doesn't require dependency back to the monolith. Why are we breaking down the monolith in the first place? Because making change in a monolith is bloody hard. It's costly and it's expensive. So if you have a dependency back to the monolith, your speed of change for this nice new shiny service is gonna be as fast as the speed of change in your monolith. So if you have a website, a retail website, let's say your buy path requires promotion, uh, pricing and promotion as a functionality, Maybe that's a good option to bring out because your monolith would be dependent on it. But the world is not a rational place. Sometimes we have to do things in the other order and serve, we have to extract services that have dependencies back to the monolith. If you have to do that, expose some APIs, build an anti-corruption layer that doesn't uh, make the monolith leak, the concepts of monolith leak into your um, new services. Number two split sticky capabilities early. So uh, a little while ago, I was uh, consulting a, uh, one, of our, one of our clients, and we were trying to de develop a roadmap as what functionality we should start breaking out of this monolith. And however we try to slice this thing up, we ended up with this sticky uh, kind of functionality that was in the monolith web sessions. If you ever build web applications, you know what a session is. It's a leaky bucket of stuff that we put in it unstructurally, and um, it can have anything from you know, your customer wish list to payment methods and so on. So one way of to deal with that, to be able to decouple services and free them up is bring that session out. Don't do this one. That's a really bad idea because you end up with that God dependency now across the network. Uh, bring that kind of leaky concept out and really reify it and create concrete, um, you know, concrete domain models. Your customer wish list will have its own and from uh, own service from the payment uh, service, so they don't leak into each other. And you can use the structural code analysis tools that are out there to to find these guide dependencies. Number three, decouple capability, not code. We often underestimate the amount of cost and effort that it takes to reuse existing code and extract it out as a service. And we overestimate the value of it. Um, at least based on my experience, a lot of the services that are already exist, they, are, they don't have a lot of intellectual property um, in them. They're somewhat simple services that majority of the code are boilerplate code to you know, serialize objects, deserialize objects, write to databases, interface with environments. And this boilerplate code would definitely change when you are moving towards microservices because most likely you're changing your technology stack. And um, very often the old code we have is, has a high level of toxicity, cyclomatic complexity, and riddled with potential bugs. So when you decide about what to extract, if you have a service, again, pricing and promotion in a retail domain, it's a very intellectually complex service. That's probably worth extracting and reusing. But if you are um, thinking about your customer profile, that's probably a simple CRUD service. It might be, you might be better off to rewrite it and um, retire the existing service. And you can use um, uh, code quality uh, um, software like check style to, to evaluate the toxicity of the code that you have. And this is, of course, a classic trade-off. Sometimes you want to refactor something that exists. Sometimes you need to rebuild it. Uh, and part of what I think is a very good approach with many of these things is to try to, when you are building code, even in the monolith itself, to try and create modules that are relatively independent of the pieces around them, because then they will be easier to play the reuse card rather than the rewrite card. And even if you are playing the rewrite card, you've got a better picture of where that can go. And tests, of course, can be very useful because if you can reorient your tests easily against the new application, you can have a better idea of what's still working with that as opposed to the old one. Number four, decouple what matters. 
Usually we, you know, fantasize with the idea of microservices and use the analogy of um, Lego puzzles, that we can snap them together and we can separate them and recompose them. And that's true when, once you have the environment set up, uh, extracting existing capabilities out of the microservice is like an organ surgery. It's actually a very difficult job. And by what matters, I mean, think about the code that you want to extract through, and look at it from the lens of change. The, find the pieces of code that change often, and you can use social code analysis tools to discuss discover these pieces of code, those are the ones that are costly because you're constantly changing them. And overlay that with your product roadmap. What product features on the roadmap and matters to your customers, that intersection is an optimal point for prioritizing the next feature that you want to bring out. And this is somewhat in tension, of course, with the notion of avoiding decoupling back to the monolith. Because if you've got areas inside the monolith that don't need to change, then that's an argument to leave that place in the monolith and provide that kind of API so that other things can call it. And certainly one of the earliest examples I saw of a monolith being broken down into a microservice approach was the, uh, the uh, application behind the Guardian newspaper, where they originally built quite a large application and they peeled, added a lot of new capabilities through uh, microservices and gradually whittled down what was there in the center. I don't know whether they ever got rid of the monolith entirely, um, but they did have this approach of saying we want to minimize changes on that monolithic code. Number five, decouple vertically and release data early. So what I've got here is a p picture of a structured monolith. So you, we've got different kinds of monoliths. The ball of mud that everything's connected to everything and you've got some sort of a structured monolith that in this case might be a layered using a layered architecture. Um, you know, you have your database layer, your business logic layer, and UI layer as independent components, but as a whole, the quantum of architecture that you need to deploy to be able to operate your system is that whole system. Architectural patterns often optimize for change. This architectural pattern optimized for change that mattered 10 years ago or longer, where you need to optimize for technical functionality, optimize the base servers that run your databases or best application servers that run your logic. We don't live in that world anymore. So microservices optimize for a different axis. They optimize for change vertically across your domain, um, domain concepts. So you want to be able to change your customer support functionality differently from and faster than maybe uh, from customer personalization. So you want to be able to extract capabilities vertically, and by that I mean extract the data, extract the logic, and uh, the API as an interface for a bounded context. And extracting data is easier said than being done, and there are patterns out there that you can, that's, that's for a whole other talk that we can talk about. And this is really the same principle as when you're building an application from the beginning in an agile manner. You want to try and build slices, the walking skeleton, and then gradually spread the, prices, the slices out. You don't want to build it through layers. Number six, go macro first and then micro. Share a little story, a little confession. Around 2013, 2014, I worked with a team of thought workers at a very good client of ours, a pizza enterprise. And we, it was our first microservices project, almost Greenfield. Uh, we had an existing application that we were extending. We went from one application to 40 services in the span of a short few months. Um, it felt good at, at first, and then we were stuck. Our build pipelines were read constantly. We didn't have uh, distributed tracing to be able to debug applications. We didn't have the right versioning, the contract testing in place. So we were pretty much stuck. We were not ready for the operational requirements of running microservices. So if you're getting started, it's completely OK to have larger services that are still encapsulating a cohesive set of capabilities. If you have a retail, maybe the shopping cart and checkout are OK to be the same service. And once you've got the operational maturity, you can, you can break them apart. And we, we had a very good successful project a couple of years ago with a, uh, with a retailing company where they actually built the system from scratch using microservices. And when we're talking about microservices, there were about a dozen services, and each team had about half a dozen to a dozen people on the team. So that's not super small, but it still uh, worked very effectively. And we do believe we could have shoved that much code into James Lewis's head. <laughs> Number seven. If you're taking one thing out of this talk, I want it to be this. Migrate in atomic evolutionary steps. So uh, a CEO, a CTO of a large company that I was working with had this giant poster of tiny little colorful boxes and lines 
in his office. And when, if, when I first met him, I looked at the diagram and I was impressed, impressed of his achievement and all these services that he had built. But then after working with him for a little while, I realized that diagram was sharing a different story. There were battle scars. There were scars of half-finished abandoned migrations, um, technology refresh or breaking down monoliths that basically were abandoned. So what we were left with, instead of one system dealing with customer information, we had five systems that had different bits of customer information and none of them was able to actually give customer information you can act on. So the, one of the principles that we adopted as a group was that every migration, every step of the migration, every little project that we developed has to take us to a better place. What do I mean by that better place? I'm going to use this diagram to describe it. Describe it. On the axis, on the y-axis of diagram, I, I have something that called um, architecture fitness functions. It's a it's a concept that um, uh, the book Building Revo Evolutionary Architecture has introduced. The book is written by ThoughtWorks, and um, basically, it's a concept taken from genetic algorithms. Uh, an objective way of assessing the integrity of your arch architecture, or the objective, uh, the outcome of the ar architecture. In this particular case, I have a speed of the experimentation. They wanted to build an ar architecture that could experiment with fast. The other axis, x-axis showing time as you evolve your architecture. So what happens when we're making change? Usually things get worse. To give you an example, we're introducing a new authentication system. So we're going from username password to OAuth. We introduce OAuth. If we leave it there, now we've got in a worse place because now we have two ways of authenticating, introducing change and testing would be more difficult and more timely. To finish that as a unit, to take us to a better place in terms of our fitness function output, we need to retire the old uh, authentication, redirect the consumers to the new service. And that's what I mean by atomic steps of architectural evolution. To, if we happen to abandon our migration, uh, migration journey, at least we have made improvements. This is a quick summary of the technical tips that we talked about. That's the um, URL to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the diagram, um, to the article, if I can talk. Um, and then, you know, there are a set of other criteria that you may want to apply that are, you know, political criteria, how to get budget to the architectural changes, and, um, and that's out of the scope of this talk. But I want to leave you with one thought. Um, usually, these are, these are great technical tips. But when you start doing microservices, you need to change the value system and the principles that you had been applying if you were building monolithic applications. It may be recent technology. Maybe they were you know, Ruby on Rails or PHP applications. But you are optimizing for a different, different criteria. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that created those problems. My last thought is one of the most important things about microservices is it is actually primarily a change in organization. A lot of organizations separate people through the activities that they do, and in, often in software systems that involve software layers and things of that kind. Microservice thinking is about changing that and saying we want to organize people through business capabilities, providing all the skills both across software layers, also across the general development skills such as business analysts and testing and infrastructure and all the rest of it. It's that change to these units of people that can handle entire business capability that is the heart of what microservice is about. And that's an organizational change. And the bad news is that that is usually tougher than any technological change. Ah, yes, and the book to talk about that. I forgot that I got that build on there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so hopefully Martin and I have convinced you that microservices is a good thing. We have given you some steps to take away and start extracting microservices out of your monolith. Uh, you go back to work, and a couple of months down the track, you've got n number of services. What complexity have you introduced? Can anybody tell me what that shows? You've introduced that many number of interconnectivity between your services. You've introduced that many number of uh, points of failure, friction between your teams. So how do we deal with this new, brave, complex world that we've created? And the answer is platforms. So creating platforms out of the services and APIs that can be in a self-serve used by the developers, putting the developer experience at the heart of that. I'm not going to go through the platform. My colleagues Ryan and Rambir about 4 o'clock and talk about platforms and hiding complexity out of the microservices and deal with this new brave world of microservices. Thank you.